Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video with myself and Marta, where as always, you guessed it, I am here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. We have a fair bit to get through today and we are going to kick off proceedings with a little something that AMD have released for FreeSync 2, as today they have released a tech demo showcasing the capabilities of FreeSync 2. Now, unfortunately, this isn't a benchmark, and AMD have actually issued out a little bit of a statement to basically reiterate that. And I think they have definitely needed that clarity because I don't think I can blame you for thinking this was a benchmark because it has a comprehensive list of video and audio settings, frame rate counter, um, you can like, move around the sequence and you can reverse it, and basically it has all the hallmarks of a benchmarking tool. But Oasis, which is the name of the demo, is absolutely not. It's basically just to show you the difference between HDR on versus off, and of course FreeSync on versus off as well. And the actual statement from AMD says, quote, the purpose of this application is to demonstrate the features and advantages of AMD Radeon FreeSync and AMD Radeon FreeSync 2 HDR over conventional display methods. This application is not meant to be a benchmark, nor is meant to be a tool with which to compare products. So again, it literally is, as I said, just a demo to show you the difference between FreeSync and FreeSync 2, as well as, of course, not having any FreeSync at all. So if you wanted to check it out, then of course, by all means, I will put a link to the source video for this in the description below this video. Unfortunately, it's not actually available for download yet, but of course it will be shortly. So let's move on, shall we, as we have Intel's Foveros to discuss next. Now, if this name rings a bell, it absolutely should. Intel did detail this in their Intel Architecture Day. But just in case you need a reminder or you somehow miss this, basically Fovero, so Fovero, so I don't actually know the pronunciation to be honest, helps connect chips and chiplets in a single package and essentially is designed to match the performance and functionality of a monolithic SOC. And the size of the SOC for Foveros is actually really small. It's just 12 by 12 millimeters. And now they have detailed a bit more about the Intel Lakefield SOC, which has the Foveros 3D packaging technology. This is going to be the first SOC that is going to be utilizing from this new tech. So with Lakefield specifically, we have a single high performance 10nm Sony Cove core, and we have four 10nm based smaller cores as well. And we even have graphics on this chip as well. And we also see 1.5 megs of L2 cache, four megs of last level cache or LLC. Again, we see the Gen 11 graphics, LPDD4 memory, and a Gen 11.5 display processor. And again, this is all squeezed onto this SOC, which is just 12 by 12, which is frankly crazy. And we even have a bit of a statement here from Intel about Lakefield and the Foveros technology, which has made it possible in its current state. And they have said, quote, the result is a product that is optimized for power efficiency, immersive graphics, IO, and memory, all in this tiny SOC, which is approximately 12 millimeters squared. We then pair this hybrid CPU architecture approach with an innovative 3D packaging technique we call Foveros that allows us to actually stack various pieces of IP together in three dimensions rather than two. So the possibilities for this hybrid CPU design are pretty huge to be honest. It gives OEM so much breathing room and obviously gives them the option for a smaller solution to build around. You know, you could squeeze this Lakefield part onto a very small motherboard indeed and we could even see this being used for devices that maybe previously weren't possible with the current technology before Lakefield. Obviously, Intel has some very high expectations for Lakefield and the Foveros technology, and I can't really blame them because, honestly, it's pretty impressive what they've actually managed to pull off. We have a compute-heavy and power-efficient SoC, or at least the potential for it, I suppose you should say, what I really want to see and actually is performance numbers because we are expecting this to launch probably around the holidays. Of course, we've seen reports that we're going to be seeing um, 10 and M before this, but that was regarding Ice Lake. This is Lake Field, which is different. So 
Hopefully before too long we will get some raw performance on this, but I have to say Lakefield is looking mighty promising. But speaking of SOCs, the next topic on our itinerary is actually regarding the NYX Qualcomm Snapdragon SOC. Now for all things mobile, of course, 5G has been the sort of the buzzword, I guess, the thing that we're all sort of looking towards as like the next big step. It's going to be next year probably, as I just discussed before, that it's really going to take off because obviously the, the infrastructure needs to be in place for users like you and I to actually connect to 5G networks. And obviously we need to see the support within the phones themselves as well. But Qualcomm have basically said that in 2020 we will also see a Snapdragon SoC that has an embedded 5G modem. Now, this is important to note that it's embedded because obviously at the moment we do have people jumping on the 5G bandwagon as it were and the Snapdragon 855 has an integrated LTE modem and the 5G capabilities are left to the Snapdragon X50. So obviously this leads to larger and bulkier phones and obviously heavier as well and it's also this two chips are taking more space. It's not exactly rocket science but in this case we're going to have them on a single chip. So Qualcomm have basically said that the integrated 5G modem means that future handsets with this will have the same battery life as current LTE CE phones and they have a bit of a statement here as well from the Qualcomm president Cristiano Amen and he said quote the integration of our breakthrough 5G multi-mode modem and application processing technologies into a single SOC is a major step in making 5G more wildly available across regions and tiers following the wave of flagship 5G devices from the more than 20 OEMs and 20 mobile operators who have committed to launching 5G networks and mobile handsets based on our 5G modems this year. So it does look like, as I've already said, that 2020 is very much going to be the year of 5G because an embedded solution is obviously more elegant and more preferred than having two chips doing the same job, essentially. So next up, we're going to move over to some console news as we have some comments for, from Phil Spencer regarding what they have in store for us at E3 this year. Now, one of the things that Phil touched on, which was made to some comments in PC Gamer, was regarding all the new studios they've acquired and Microsoft have not been shy about the fact that they're making a huge push for buying up all these studios and obviously really planning to have some actual content for the new systems because as great as the Xbox One and Xbox One X are it has been a bit of a meme that it is lacking in real killer exclusives obviously plenty of multi-platform great games on there but they have been a bit lacking and obviously Microsoft have been really pushing hard to correct this for the future and Phil touched on this a little bit because obviously it's always a bit concerning when your favourite studio, for example, like Ninja Theory with Hellblade, which I loved, by the way, um, gets bought by a, you know, a massive corporation like Microsoft. You're like, mm, are they going to manage to keep what actually made them a good studio? And, well, if you believe what Phil has to say, they are going to let each studio retain their quote-unquote unique spirits. And Phil said, quote, we want to each studio to retain their unique spirits and culture while feeling empowered by the collective resources they now have as a member of Xbox Game Studios and Microsoft. We're here to help lift any of the distractions and challenges that have kept them from doing what they do best. The opportunity for collaboration and shared learning across the new and existing teams is potentially what's most exciting to me. It's been inspiring to hear stories of already how incredible the talents are across these teams are reaching out to connect, share and learn from one another. Now he has also touched a little bit on PC gaming. Now Microsoft promised eons ago that they were going to be improving PC gaming experience and they have definitely taken steps to do that. It has gotten better. There are still work to be done. Windows Store is awful, everyone knows this, but at least we don't have a Games for Windows Live situation going on anymore. I'd rather not go back to that. I mean, Windows 10 Store is, is pretty bad, but it's only really the Microsoft exclusives that are being locked to it, so yeah. Anywho, we have a bit of a statement here about how they're still going to be pursuing improving the PC experience. And he said, quote, delivering gate gaming, gate great great let me try with some English. Great gaming. There we go. Simple words, hard to say, apparently. Delivering great gaming experiences to PC players is critically important to the future of Xbox and gaming and Microsoft as we have a responsibility to invest in new ways we can benefit the PC player to help ensure they stay at the centre of the experience. 
While we are plan proud of our PC gaming heritage, we've made some mistakes along the way. We know we have to move forward, informed by our past with the unique wants, needs and challenges of the PC player at the centre of decisions we make. I know we talk quite a bit over time about what we want to deliver for the player on PC, but at E3 this year and throughout 2019, you'll begin to see where we've been investing to deliver across store, services in Windows and great games. It's just the beginning. And you may have seen the reports going around regarding the specifics of these plans for the future. Feature. For example, according to the rumours I've seen floating around, they're testing a new way to deliver games that uses the same format used on the Xbox One, which is .xvc. So this could possibly be an attempt to basically simplify the process of porting an Xbox One game to the PC. Um, this is something they're just testing, of course, but it could have a lot of potential, actually. But maybe have some downsides that perhaps we don't realise at present. We'll have to see. Obviously we should wait for official announcements. This may never see the light of day. They might decide, you know what, this has too many drawbacks or it's actually more difficult than we realise or blah de blah de blah. So yeah, wait and see what Microsoft actually have in store, but it does look like E3 is going to be an interesting one. Now of course the game studios that they've just bought are not going to have anything for us yet at E3, but they've undoubtedly been some studios that they purchased earlier that they only revealed at E3 that they were purchased that have been cooking something up for quite some time and they might have an early demo for us even if the actual game won't come out for ages. We'll have to see. It's going to come around really quick because even though it's only February now, it's already the end of February somehow. So we both know I'm going to blink and I'm going to be sitting there watching E3 with a bowl of popcorn on my lap as always. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.